operating characteristic or OC curves are a key part of a sampling plan. They help you understand if you take a sample, how likely are you to accept that sample? So let's take a look at general OC curve properties and see what these particular curves are telling you. In this video, we'll talk about the different parts of an OC curve and then what information you need to put together an OC curve. Actually putting together that curve is a different video. Here are some sample OC curves. So you can see we have three different curves here. They have different N and C values if we look at this legend right here. N is your sample size. So here the purple and the red curve have a sample size of 50. The blue curve has a sample size of 100. C is how many non-conforming units you can have in your sample. Here in the purple curve and the blue curve, C is zero. And that means if we take a sample, we can't have any non-conforming units in that sample to say that the sample is acceptable. Whereas in the red curve, C is two. And so that means in our sample, we can have two non-conforming units and still call the sample acceptable. Let's take a look at what that actually looks like in a particular sample. When we think about our sample, we're thinking about, okay, is this sample good or not? And that relates to what's called the probability of acceptance, which is how likely are you to accept that sample? So if we take a sample out of our 104 little balls here, let's say we take these nine and we see all of them are orange. Now, if we're looking for all orange balls, that's great. That means there's no defects or no non-conformities in the sample. And so our sample here says, okay, your lot is good to go based on this sample. What if we take another sample over here? This sample has a white ball in it. And if we want only orange balls, then that white ball says, eh, there might be something wrong with this lot. But whether or not we reject the sample has to do with our C or the number of nonconformities that we allow in our sample. So if C is zero here, then we have to reject a lot based on the sample because we have a nonconforming unit here. But if C is one or two, we're okay because we're allowed one or two nonconforming units in our sample and that's what we have here. Let's take a few more samples. If we sample over here and we're looking for orange balls, doesn't really matter what C is, zero, one, two, three, four, we are going to accept the lot based on this sample. If we sample over here, we have two nonconforming units. So we're okay if C is two or higher, but if C is zero or one, we need to reject that lot. So you can see how C affects whether or not you're going to accept that your lot is okay based on your sample. Note that your sample size can also affect how many nonconformities you pick up. So if I sample in this corner here, if my sample size was smaller, let's say four, then I might just box off this little corner here and I say, well, I've got four orange balls and that's what I'm looking for, so my sample's okay. If I go out to 16, then I don't pick up any more nonconformities here, but if I'd sampled over here and I had a sample that was right here versus it included these two, I could be okay on one sample and not okay in another sample of a different size. So your sample size, in addition to your acceptance criteria, so N and C, determine your probability of acceptance. Let's see what that looks like on the chart. Here's our chart again. So we have our three different curves and our axes are the probability of acceptance or how likely we are to accept the lot versus the percent non-conforming in the population. So if we go back to our lot here of orange balls or what is supposed to be orange balls, that's 104 balls and we have five balls that are white. So we have about 0.48% non-conforming in our population. However, you look at this little sample here, we have two out of nine non-conforming, which is significantly higher. But that's the non-conforming in our sample, not in our population. So keep that in mind. Your sample non-conforming does not necessarily equal your population non-conforming. And that's what your OC curves are supposed to help you out with figuring out what's the probability 
that if I have, let's say, 1% nonconforming in my population, that I'm going to have a sample that lets me accept the lot. Let's take a look at this red curve. So here our sample size is 50 and C is 2, so we are allowed two nonconforming units in that sample of 50 before we can say, all right, we have to reject this lot. There's too many nonconformities. So the probability of acceptance, if we have percent nonconforming in the population of 1%, that's almost 100% right here. So we are very, very likely to accept the lot under the sampling plan N of 50, C of 2. What happens if we drop our acceptance criteria, our C, down to 0? Well, then we get the purple curve. So here, if we have 1% nonconforming in our population, we have a probability of somewhere around 0.65, or 65% chance of accepting our lot based on that sample. And that's because every sample has to be perfect for you to accept that lot. There is no nonconformities allowed in any sample. And so your probability of acceptance drops because if you have 1% nonconforming in your population, you're likely to pick up at least one nonconforming unit in a sample of 50. Let's look at that blue curve now at 1%. With 100 units in your sample, that's a lot of units. 1% nonconforming in your population, you are pretty much guaranteed to pick up something that is not quite right. And you may get lucky and have a sample that doesn't have any nonconforming units, but the odds of that are somewhere around 0.35 or 35%. So you only have a 35% chance of accepting your lot if you have 1% nonconforming in your population. In terms of food products, that means that if you have a lot where, let's say you have one dented can out of 100, you are very likely to reject that lot in a sampling versus if you have 1% dented cans and you set your sampling plan so that you are only taking 50 cans, and you're allowing two of them to be dented and you can still ship that lot, then you're much more likely to ship the lot with a couple of dented cans in it. And so this is something to think about when you are setting up your OC curve. How big is your sampling size and what's your acceptance criteria? If you have a defect that doesn't really matter in terms of overall quality, maybe you have a crate of apples and a couple of them have a few blemishes, some odd shapes, maybe it doesn't really matter that those are like that because the apples are still good um, and they're still tasty and they're still safe to eat. So you can set your acceptance criteria a little higher and be a little bit more tolerant of defects. However, if you're doing microbial sampling, let's say you're testing for E. coli and ground beef, you don't want any of your samples to test positive. So you're going to set your OC curve with a very low acceptance criteria, probably zero, and you're gonna take a lot of samples so you can make absolutely sure that there's no E. coli in your ground beef. These are all things to keep in mind when you're constructing an OC curve, and we'll talk about how to construct those particular OC curves and do the calculations in a follow-up video.